I'm Scott Abanks, obviously. I've been home now 13 months. Came home February 23rd last year. And it's been quite a trip. Oftentimes, people ask me, what has it been like to be released after so long? And I can imagine in your mind, uh, things can be difficult, pretty just and reacclimating to society. But in all honesty, it hasn't been that difficult. Obviously, I have a large support group. I'm blessed by God. You know, I have five siblings. You know, both my parents, God bless, are still alive. And unfortunately, three weeks ago, my grandmother passed away. So I got to go down in Florida and, and seen a whole bunch of relatives I haven't seen in that period of time from all over the world, from England, from Jamaica, which is our, my father's side of the family, our home country. Uh, from Canada and all over the states that came to my grandmother's funeral. Uh, we're somewhat subtly taught, sometimes directly taught, to be pessimistic, you know, in our approach to life. Like, oh, you know, don't trust people, you know, uh, you know don't talk to strangers, you know. Uh, contrary to that, I was never like that as a kid. I was a kid that would go up and talk to everybody. I was playful, I was nerdy. I was, uh, subsequently became a punk rock kid. Uh, I listened to heavy metal, punk rock, hardcore, you know. It's a member of the New York hardcore scene. I'm an original DMS skinhead. I know that's probably blowing your mind because you see all this long hair. <laughs> I haven't had a haircut since 1991, going through reception in Downstate Correctional Facility. I let my hair grow. I got my hair off in 88. I had started growing it then, but going through some life changes then, and plus I was 18 years old, didn't really know what I wanted, just thought I knew what I wanted. Um, those choices led to this, getting into a fight in front of a bar on Avenue A, Lower East Side of Manhattan. 13 kids were involved, ages ranging between 18 and 26, the oldest one. And uh, three kids were stabbed, one of them died. That was Mr. Lee Wells, it was mentioned in the film. A young man that they mentioned in the film was uh, granted a plea bargain, two and a half to 25, and two and a half to five. And in his cooperation in the case, and he implicated me in a murder. So to save his own skin, he made a videotape confession to the prosecutor. They built a case around that, and they arrested me two months later. There was three witnesses on my behalf. One of them was the superintendent of the apartment building across the street, his wife, who described us all the way down to our sneakers, our shoes, our, our jackets. She said I didn't stab anyone. The other two people that testified on my behalf were also stabbed. They were friends of the young man that passed away, and they also said that I didn't stab their friend. Yet I still would try. They brought three other witnesses, one that I had to fight with, and two people who had nothing to do with my case, who were granted immunity in cases that had absolutely nothing to do with mine. One drug possession charge and one weapon possession, gun, gun possession charge. Well, their things got expunged for their testimony. I went to jury trial, which lasted a period of two and a half weeks. And after two days of deliberation, they found me guilty of murder in the second degree. A month later, I was sentenced to 22 to life. I was 21 years old. I was around you guys' age. I have been at nine max jails, five mediums. As we had had a previous class, I was asked which were the worst jails. And and, um, and being in nine match jails, you could say they're all potentially bad. Uh, Kasaki, Attica, Great Meadow Correctional Facility, which we call Comstock, Auburn, those are probably the worst that I've been in. And a lot of times that's attributed not merely to the violence, but to the lack of programming. You know, idle, idle mind, idle time. I don't mind, you don't have much programming, you don't have an incentive to do good, 
Uh, you're, you're not trying to better yourself. You guys are working ways in the yard. You saw I'm working the problems, and you know, there's a lot of emotional problems in that prison yard. There's a lot of uh, single parents or no parent families. There's a lot of former drug addiction. Uh, now there's no drugs involved. Now you're sweating it out in the prison. And you're taking out your emotions and your feelings on the next guy. You know, if somebody is pretty well to do, and their family members are coming to see them, and they're getting regular packages, like me, you get you know, you're getting food, you got new clothes, this guy over here is broke. He's from the hood, and he's broke, and he's looking at you, oh, I want to steal your sneakers. But you get food every month. Oh, your girlfriend comes to see you every month. Oh, look at you, you pretty boy. Yes, you will have to fight, or you will sign in to protect the custom. That wasn't an option. Did a little bit more than two years in solitary confinement for our fights. I had multiple fights and incidents in the jail. It's, you know, it's fight or flight. It took a moment with my father. I was in Sing Sing. I was in special housing unit, getting into some trouble. And he told my father that I had stabbed another young man. And my father was sitting in the chair crying. Now, mind you, my father's a Vietnam veteran. He was a veteran police officer for 20 years. And uh, seeing my father cry broke me. This is the hardest man I know. This is a government trained killer. He served one year in Vietnam, 6th or 6th Calvary, jumped out of airplanes and shot people for a year, came home and made me. So to see him cry, that. I had to change myself. But being in the reality of prison, you, you have choices to make here. You, know, you don't want to be that guy walking around the yard with razor cut on your face. You don't want to die in there either. So being a New York City street kid, but also being the former intelligent nerdy kid, I fell back from that and I furthered my education while incarcerated. I became drug and alcohol counselor, became an AIDS counselor, as I mentioned, a teacher's aide. I also won a Penn Award in 2007. I'm a performance artist poet under the name Ja Chemistry. If you like, you can go on my Instagram. It's Ja underscore chemistry. It's like J-A-H underscore chemistry. I'm performing now. I did a show Saturday, and my career started to take off. Soon I'll be putting music to this. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's all about choices. What do you want to do with yourself? You know, you, you're in prison and you start learning. You start getting a degree of enlightenment. You start seeing the world is much bigger than you and your situation. And from that premise, I realized that even Lee, uh, not, not Lee, I mean, even Ali, the, the kid that made the statement against me, I'm not even angry at him. You see, he was played against me, and that's the way the system works, or at least the way it's worked to this point. We're looking for a conviction. We're going to lock you up. Tell us what you got. Who did this? Who's responsible? We'll cut you a deal. We live in a society where everything comes down to money. Many few of you here are going to one day be attorneys and prosecutors, and God bless you. Some of you will be in the law enforcement community. But I have every faith you as young people could potentially change this. I know that you can. Things will be changed through legislation and through enlightenment, education. Things will not be changed by standing in the streets screaming Black Lives Matter and throwing objects at police. I've been in a couple of riots. The one that they mentioned there, I was at two of those. I've been to anti clan rallies. I've been to rallies. Nothing gets changed that way. It gets changed right here in this classroom. That's where it will get changed. I'm thankful to have the opportunity to speak to all of you because, if, like I said, if anything's ever going to change, it's going to change through you. You know, after you finish time in college, you'll have these exorbitant student loans to pay off. Now, you think of it. Somebody that's just working in a prosecutor's office, they need that job, and they want to further their career. So what do you do? You've got to win that case. Even if sometimes the evidence might be a little bit skewed against the person that's being prosecuted. How about this? Now you're a defense attorney. You got to defend some people that you would you'd have to ask yourself ethically: Is this 
right, but this person is afforded the opportunity to return him. If he cannot afford one, one will be appointed to him. This is the law, right? So where do you put yourself when you got to defend a guy that's locked up for raping a nine-year-old girl? He needs an attorney, doesn't he? It's the law. Where do you go as a prosecutor that has a young prosecutor coming up? You have to win that case. Man, I mean, some of the evidence doesn't look like this kid is too guilty. The Center of Law and Justice has a tally that 23% of the people who are incarcerated in the continental U.S. are actually innocent of what they're indicted of. I didn't make that tally up. That was the Center of Law and Justice. That means that there's nearly a quarter of the people uh, out of the state penitentiary, 2.2 million people, and out of people awaiting to go to trial, combined with that number would be 9.6 million people. You mean to tell me a quarter of that is actually innocent? But yet we live in the greatest country in the world. Why? Money, venture capitalism, you gotta pay them student loans. Why would a pre-med student change his major for being a cardiologist or a pediatrician to doing plastic surgery? Because I make more money putting in breast implants and doing rhinoplasty. You gotta pay them damn student loans. And that BMW ain't gonna pay for itself. And my girlfriend, she's driving me crazy. I gotta pay them bills. Yeah, so I'm going to push this to the side. You guys are faced with a dilemma. You are our future. But I want you to think about this. You know, the, the ethics of it, you know, the morals of it. I, I, like I said, I'm thankful to be here. And that's largely why I'm smiling. I am free, and I have this opportunity to speak to all of you. If you think it's a little bit kooky after going through all that stuff, then I'm smiling. You could go through anything, and you can smile. There's people that went through way worse than me. We have, I have met all across the body. Imagine that. You know, many of us here are uh, from the African diaspora. Our ancestors were brought here on slave ships, cargo holes that were five by three. And we've endured uh, hardships all the way to this day, from lynching, rape, murder, to institutional racism. Yet we still exist. So we can overcome anything. Yeah. So uh, were there any corrections? officers that were especially positive or negative in your journey? I've had both ends of the spectrum extreme. Mind you now, correction officers, American citizen, they have their opinions and their beliefs too. You might have one that's a good old boy. We don't know what he does after work. Well, who's no. your, how is that the favorite correction officer in the 26 years? Oh, my favorite. There's a few. There are a few, there's a, and there are various ethnicities and, and genders, because there's female officers there too. There are those that work in the Department of Corrections that view each individual as an individual, even though they're trained to see us as a group. It's kind of impossible to do that. You know, you got somebody like me, street kid, selling coke, selling crack, got caught up, got in trouble, got in a fight, got locked up. But my mom still comes to visit me. I go on trail, look how little you got. Look, this is all set up like this for a reason. But you don't have to be victimized by it. Yes, Professor? Uh, now, what was the reason the parole board turned you down the first time? That, and was it a two part question? And when you heard their decision, how did you handle it emotionally? Oh, how can you handle it emotionally? Their, their reasons are like obscure and vague. Uh, we feel at this time to release uh, inmate events would so undermine the serious nature of the crime as to deprecate the serious nature of the law. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> now, did you, you know, have you ever seen the movie Shawshank Redemption? Too many times. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, you know the, the, the great scene where. Um, he finally, instead of saying, I'm going to, I'm cured or whatever, you know, I'm, I'm better, he says, I know you're not going to give me parole. And then they give him parole. Now, were you, did you have to say that you did it or didn't oh, do no. it? Or? I, I held the course and held my hat my hand through all three of my parole board hearings. I mean, they, I mean, did you, did they, because you, you've always maintained that you didn't do it. Now, was that part of it, that you had to say, you well, finally would say you did it, or By the not? time, I, I had a lawyer going through all three of them, so by the time my parole package, 
at their table. They're already aware of my stance. I took full responsibility because I started the fight. But I had no idea my friend at the time, my compadre over here, was going to stab one of the guys. It was a fist fight. And his friend hit me over the head with a garbage can. Like, hey, if I had got my ass whipped on that day, I could have lived with that. It would have been a lot better than doing 25 years, 9 months, 23 days in prison. But he took it upon himself to do that. And then when he was arrested, he pointed me out to save his own life. Uh, is he in prison now, or is he? Oh no. Last, last I heard, was a heavy drug user, not too healthy. God bless him. You see, I, when you really sit back and you think about, it, I, I came home from prison, and I had many of my brothers, like my brother Dominic, that came to me to every war, and they'll tell you. Hey, bro, when you get home, man, you're going to see guys, man, are still as messed up as when you got locked up. And that was hard for me to accept. Like, are you serious? Because contrary to that, I see a lot of guys who grew up with it and, and you grow They have husband and wife and kids and pay a mortgage. And you, you mean to tell me, like, hey, Joe Blow over here is still sitting in the bar drinking, looking for a next hit of cocaine. Like, really? You know, while this one over here has, you know, wife, kids, 401k, and... He's doing good for himself. I, I came home and seen it. I've been home 13 months, and I honestly can tell you, I'm doing better than a lot of people that have been out here in that time. I own my own truck. I got Geico insurance. <laughs> you, know, my little, my little you know, I broke three cell phones already. That's the new one. Um, I'm thinking of buying a house. I even was with a loan officer. Uh, I get a, a credit and a fourteen thousand dollars or something like that as a person in the world. I'm headed in that direction. I've only been home 30 months. I and mean, these guys, you know, they're, they're getting that bus and subway hard. I'm already trying. And even when I need to clean up a bit, I can get a little bit snazzy. You know? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm feeling happy with myself, Professor. I'm doing good. Thank God. That's awesome. Zero. I'm an employee of Mohawk Honda. I work in the detail department of, if not the largest, one of the largest Honda dealerships on the Eastern Sea. It's the second biggest on the Eastern Sea code. Here you go. My, my little brother, my trusty assistant, thank you very much, <laughs> uh, We sold over 6,000 cars last year. Uh, there's a room for advancement in my career. We sell vehicles that pretty much sell themselves. They're very dependable. I mean, there's more Honda Accords on the road than Toyota Corollas than anything else. Right? So, uh, Honda Accords and Civics, CRVs are the number one sold uh, SUV in America. So my job is great. Everybody there, uh, all my supervisors, all the guys I work with, all the ladies I work with, they're all beautiful. You know? So I I haven't had any problem getting a job. I mean, there was over 7,000 people that signed the petition for Lisa. So. I have a place to sleep throughout the time. Now tell, tell this class about your parole officer, because I think we only hear the bad stories about parole. All right, I'm going to tell you about my parole officer. Before I do, I'm going to tell you this. Please keep in mind, this is coming from a guy that was in prison for almost 26 years. Police officers in every capacity, peace officer status, whatever it may be, have a very difficult job. And it wears on me. My father was a cop for 20 years. Sounds crazy, right? My uncle was a poor officer captain, and my aunt dad was a sergeant. Yet I was in prison. So I've seen both sides of the spectrum. I've seen my dad come home in his high clothes from a lady putting a cigarette out of his face. Uh, I'm well aware of the shootings and the brutality. I'm well aware when police become victims, just a routine traffic stop, and getting shot like the two officers in Crown Heights. They have a rough job. I think that their training needs a, a touch-up, needs a pick-me-up. I think that uh, a lot of officers that didn't grow up around blacks and Latinos and people in the hood, they end up going through the academy and they're taught to observe and report people that look like us. 
I mean, you might very well be on your way to John Jay to get an education. Hey, you get up against the wall. They're, they're taught this. They're not taught to be objective. They're taught to do this job like this. Prison is the same way. Like I said, they're, they're going to look at you all as a group. It's, it's a tough job you know, being a CEO, being in any law enforcement capacity. Now, it was always, that was always a difficult thing for me, too. When something would happen out in the world, and like in Ferguson, Missouri, and everybody said, man, that guy was wrong. And, and I say, well, always put yourself in those shoes. How would you react? You do a job where people are actually getting hurt. And the one day you go to work, and you're not on point, you get shot. I mean, it's, it's weird. It's crazy. Who, who writes a book for this? We live in a venture capitalist society. Everything is driven by money. You got people with psychiatric problems, all kinds of stuff. And you're hired now to uh, protect and serve the greater public. You know, it's, it's crazy. Can you even tell us about your parole officer? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. My parole okay. officer is great. My parole officer is a vet, veteran parole officer. And uh, he's been on the job so long that his, his observation of the individual, you know, you do something so long, he, he knows what he's dealing with. Plus, he understands recidivism because that's part of his job. A person like me that's done over 15 years in prison, they're least likely to come back. Recidivism in New York State is 1% for somebody with 15 years of medical. And it's 0.062 throughout the continental U.S. The likelihood of somebody with 15 years or better would ever come back is like almost zero. Contrary to what people tell you, like they want you to go there. How long were you on parole? For another two years, and then I'm eligible for my certificate. Curfew, no drugs, no involvement with any type of illegal activity. I can't be involved with anything bad. <laughs> uh, and you know, your desires change too when you get older. You don't want to be involved. If it was, I don't know how you could get less than mine or Maybe not to the level of enlightenment of mine. You know, like if if it was still the homies in the hood and I was going back to the hood or something like that, or, or I, which I didn't grow up in a housing project, but let's say that was what was available to me. And I had to return back to the hood. And the only person that could help me is guys that was bubbling and made their money and wanted to bless me. And, and that was my support group. Yeah, that wouldn't be conducive to me. If my support group were a bunch of upper cross, well-educated attorneys and lawyers and people that had stock options, well, I would be with that. I mean, if you if you want to be a millionaire, who you should hang out with? Somebody that's broke, you hang out with a millionaire. You want to learn how to play golf? You need to get your behind on the golf course. So, so you really are the company you keep. You know, if you plan on life, if you plan on an existence, not saying that poor people don't need love, because hell, all of us are poor people. We come from working class families, but for the, for the most part. But now, if you want to advance yourself, shouldn't you be around people doing better than you that you could learn from, that could teach you? How did you invest your money? How did you do that? You know, what's the one? No, I've been saving the battery doing spurts here and there. It's not going to go out. Like you got like 10 phone calls. Huh? You got like 10 phone calls, too. <laughs> in general are all together. Latino brothers, are, they're all together. Now, the black group breaks up into groups. The groups break up into groups. You have black people that are Caribbean. So the Jamaicans, the Trinidadians, the Guyanese, they're all together. So I'm with them. But I'm still black. So the, the God bodies, you know, nation of gods and earth, the Muslim brothers, they're, they're so, yo, what up, brother? Yo, what up? So now, over here, you got Latino brothers, you got brothers Bariqua, you got Cubano, you got brothers that Dominicano. 
Africans, all, all people too, and all of them are black too in various degrees. Now, because of the language barrier, there's a separate cultural and language barrier, there's separation. Crazy. My ex-wife is Puerto Rican and Jewish. My brother Dominic here is an Italian and Puerto Rican. I grew up with a whole bunch of Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. You get to jail and they tell you, you can't use that phone. I said, why not, bro? So yo, that's the Bahipa phone. You can't use that phone. Why? Your star, you can't use a blood cloud phone. I did so rust. No, I'm Jamaican. It's not just my hair. I really am. My family's from St. Louis. Brethren, come in. We don't have to use a phone. Why? Things are separated in prison, which was weird to me. I, I didn't grow up like that. But in jail, and they got a phone for just the white guys. You got an Italian guy, tough Irish guy, mob guys, and they got the phone. Got, you know, and you break up in groups. One of the old West Indian guy who was a friend of mine got cut in the face with a razor over the phone. So I got the guy that cut the old man over the face with a razor. Because he's Jamaican and we protect our own. And that's the way you jail hands out. You will protect your own. Because if you don't, they will come to get you next. <laughs> Not a good thing. Oh, well, hold on for one minute, sweetie, because she had a question for you, and I hope you didn't forget. Well, okay, so were you, you may have said this, I was very vague, but were you the only person convicted in the stabbing? I was the only person convicted in the stabbing. I was one of two people that was convicted in the whole issue itself. The other guy copped out to the two and a half. Well, you should give him a little history in about Ali and stuff, how he was a diplomat's son. No, that's a different Ali. Oh, the, but the other one. Yeah, that's, the, that's the other Ali. The one that... That's all... Well, that's a whole other thing. It's a case within the case. It's nuts. But, yeah. So they cut him. They, they found him. They so arrested him the next day. Okay, and then he... He made a videotape statement to maybe a Daniel Bibb and was told him about his family. At first, and at first we went through a weird time, and I think my father, I know my father was racist. He kind of left me hanging. Like, you know, I come from a somewhat financially stable family. At the time, my father owned four houses. He had three rental properties and a house to live in. And he could have helped me, and he helped me limit it. And I think in his mind, he thought I was going to Anyone that looks at my case now, you know, years later, they say, like, how are you even in jail? Then it comes down to region. You know, if this same case happened in the state of Florida or Texas, I wouldn't be going in. But we live in the way this state is, and I love New York City. I'm a New Yorker. But you have different laws and the way they're handled. You know, like if somebody came to your house threatening to rob you in Texas, on your property, you can shoot them. They might give you an award and a box of bullets. <laughs> Florida, stand your ground. Over here, you do that. I had an old man locked up with me, World War II veteran, had an M1 Garand registered to him under his bed. A story of Queens. A guy burglarized his house. He heard him fussing around in the house. The guy came upstairs. Old man Sam walked in. The old, little old man, 73 years old. I was in Sing Sing. That was 1990. Old man walked slow like this. Sweet little old Irish man, World War II vet. He picked up his M1 Garand and he said, Hey, who's in my hallway? And the guy standing there, going and came, Hey, old man, put down that rifle. So he shot him. Hey. Guy's whirling around on the floor. He tries to get up. The old man put another round, shot him again. He said, Stop moving because I can't run nowhere and I'm calling the police. So that's all the old man talked. He said, don't move no more. I'm warning you. The guy got up and getting shot. Well, needless to say, he emptied the rifle out of him. They gave that old man 8 to 30, 25. That's New York State. In Florida, they would have hugged the old man. They would have got one of those motorized little things. <laughs> they would have hooked that's something. That's something that should be in the Sweetie, you have one. Well, I had a lot of help. I had a lot of help while I was there. 
kids. You know, I was fortunate enough to have good teachers while I was there. I was around a lot of political prisoners at one time in my incarceration. Uh, the ones that you'll probably study in your courses and probably already have, like Herman Bell, who was a BLA member, uh, Seth Hayes, David Gilbert, who they, both of them are Columbia graduates. Uh, David Gilbert was in Weatherman Underground. These are people that were active in the 60s you know, against the oppression of people of color. You know, they were with the Black Panther movement, you know, for all the advancement. Of, a lot of them guys were my teachers while in prison. Hey, kid, read this book. Here, don't eat that, do this, go work out, read this. So I was around a lot of guys that were locked up but were positive influences on me. And you, you start seeing the other guys, it's real corny. Like, yeah, you're big, you're strong, you can fight, but you're, you're not smart. And you're, you know, you're, you're, and like I said to the earlier class, I see two guys get into a fight over Beyonce and Elmira. Like, how is that conducive to your life? I don't wanna hang out with them guys. I wanna hang out with the guys over here that's teaching me. I had a little mutual fun while I was in there. My mom liquidated, but I had a, a little, I used to get a prospectus from that Evergreen Mutual Fund. I said, I'm going to take a little of this money and let it flip over while I'm here. And I have a little nest egg when I come home. You know, I wanted to learn about investing. I, you know, I, I wanted to get one of those um, Sapphire cards. What is that from? What is that? Uh, Citizen Bank? Which one? Blue Ch uh, uh, Chase. Chase. I've seen a commercial. I say, oh, yeah, listen, I'm interested in all of that. You can't get involved with any of that. You're trying to. Hang out with dudes from the hood, yo, homie, yo, and I put all my money under the mattress, you heard? I put it in the back of the fridge. You know what I mean? What is it? You're, what do you learn? I want to hang out with all of y'all. Going to college. You, you're going to college. You're educating yourself. You, you're none of y'all are birds. The other one out there that's hanging out in the hood, they're bird. Y'all are all beautiful. You're, my friend should be like you. Then we can sit down and we can have an intellectual conversation about something. Then the other guy, they're talking about fashion and clothes they can't own, and then I had to drop time. Helicopter when I was in the street. I mean, I had all the girls, and after a while, it's so repetitive, and it's like, it's like it becomes like white noise, man. Like, look, listen, bro, please shut up. You're not giving me any soul food. You're not giving me anything that I could grow with. You're talking about nonsense. You're talking about. I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you right off the top. If I didn't go to prison at that particular time in my life, I'm, I'm going to use the the, high, the worst case scenario to the best. I'm, so I'm going to put the worst on the top and put the best on the bottom. I would have, one, ended up selling more drugs and probably would have gotten another type of state did. Probably been less than what I got, but it would have been a, a lot. Or I would have went to the feds and I would have got really big drugs and drug charges. Or I would have been killed in the street in a drug-related homicide or violence because these things don't happen. Or I would have ended up a 